good afternoon, I think. Yes, it's 10 past 12. We're a little bit early. I'm Dean Seddon, founder of Maverick, and we're here for War Stories and Cold Calls with my longtime debater and friend, Richard Woods. Good afternoon, Dean. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so Richard is, I've known Richard for a long time. Uh, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for him, but Richard, you're founding your new business, sales consultancy business. Yep. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so um, just for the record, it's been a long period of knowing you, um, but we're still here to tell the stories, <laughs> even, even the war stories. <laughs> we'll get um, to them in a minute. Uh, so yeah, I've um, recently um, set up a company called Esless. Esless is a sales consultancy training and telemarketing company. I think there is a gap in the market that needs to be filled. As in all businesses, they outsource many different things from finance through to marketing, but there's very few companies that are good, that do it the right way, that can do sales, outsource selling. Cool. And some of you who know me will go, oh my God, Dean has friends who do cold calling, right? <laughs> and how many times, Richard, have we had this debate about cold calling? Uh, yeah, more than <laughs> more than you've got fingers and thumbs. <laughs> so, so as a general rule, let yeah. me just preface this because you might think, "What the hell's Dean talking about?" Yeah, there's cold calling, and there's cold calling. There's there two is. different levels of it, right? Yeah. There's, so, well, the, the first one that everyone knows is, in fact, it was made famous by a very bad Welsh uh, program that was put called the Call Centre where you've got all these people crammed into like like a battery farm, headsets on, dialers going crazy, thousands of calls going through, and everyone going about cheap electric, cheap home insurance, cheap this, cheap that. And it was all about kick them, hit them hard, get through as many calls every day, make sure your durations were such that you were, weren't too long, but you were quick enough. And it was just a factory of outputting churning, numbers. Churning, basically. Yeah. At churning and burning is what I would yeah. sort of refer to it as. And there was um and the person on the other end didn't get a great experience so you would get silence you'd then get a connection you'd get somebody then that wouldn't listen they would just have to get through their script in order to deliver uh, the message in the hope that at the other end of it somebody would be buying well actually that's not how sales works sales has never really worked well that way um, there will be some people who will submit to that level of but it's like it's just plain numbers basically. yeah yeah so, a thousand people and you get a couple of bites yeah so you're probably looking at a one or less percent conversion but if you dial enough people they will say it's a numbers game and that, you know that's how people are treated the other side of cold calling, however, and it's, it's done every day, whether we're calling up for appointments, whether we're calling up to sell something, is actually understanding what the customer wants, what the customer needs, but identifying that potentially before you even go and do the call. So having an intelligent call. Yeah, let's call it intelligent cold calling as opposed to just cold calling. Yeah, so I can away. see there's going to be a TM at the end of that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, we've known each other for a long while. You knew us when our M looked a bit different. Yeah. Um, we had a long and painful journey and you're embarking on a brand new journey. Yeah, so where you were um, a couple of years back is where I am now. And... You know, back then we worked well together and we supported you and, and thankfully you're now supporting me, which is fantastic. <laughs> well, it goes around, comes around, doesn't it? <laughs> Hang on, I want to just quit. No, no, Dean, no. Dean, Dean Seddon <laughs> is supporting a cold calling business. I have to oh, put it out there. No, 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 no. I have to intelligent cold calling, Richard. <laughs> intelligent cold calling. I think, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about with the war story, some of you will know this, that... Um, there was like three, four years ago, there was a major implosion mm -hmm. in what now is Maverick. And it was quite spectacular, really, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, the fire, <laughs> the fire was locally got nothing. <laughs> um, and we basically reinvented the business. You were there actually in the middle of that pain and chaos. Um, and at one point, uh, you and some others really stood behind me at a difficult point. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I felt like I, I needed to quit, mm -hmm. um, get a bill, should I talk about this Well, to be fair, I think when I first met you, um, I had put something out onto LinkedIn saying that 
I needed some help to rebrand a business and it was my previous role. And there was 15 applications that come through and of the 15, I said, stop, that's enough. I met with you and said person uh, from the other company and, um, you know, the sizzle was there. The, mm. uh, but what, I could, what was clear for all of us, that the brains behind the operation was you. And, and I'll say that, I won't say it again, but the brains was, okay, I did, it was you. And all through the journey, um, when we've had our challenges, trying to reinvent the new brand, trying to reach audiences, in the market, you've always been very welcoming and supporting. So when um, the implosion happened, shall mm -hmm. we say, it was only right really that we stood beside you, supported you, and long may that continue. And we've had some good fun on the, along the way, right? Yeah, I think your wedding was quite an interesting oh, one. Um, my wedding. Um, I, got, I think we got exit. Me and my previous partner, business partner, got exited out of your wedding. I think. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I Cornish mean, Cornish boys know how to have a beer. Coming to business, you know, it is about the sheer will to make something happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're watching this and you're going. You know, wherever you are, I mean, COVID has wrecked a lot of businesses mm -hmm. and, and we're now coming to this point where you've got to almost start again. I mean, it is like starting a business again. It is. And this is why it's felt like a great time to come and do this, because there's lots of businesses out there. You know, you can they talked about COVID being the invisible war. And, and it really has. And you think back into the footage that we see after World War Two, when you know, houses were blown up streets were decimated, people had to go back and rebuild their lives. I don't think we'll understand the full impact, you know, for a long time yet of what's happened through COVID. But people are out there with a real can do attitude right now. They're dusting themselves down. And um, I thought I read a story on LinkedIn on the way here about a company who literally had 60 staff, they went down to 10. Um, and now they've come out of the, the other side and almost doubled the, the original headcount because mm. there's such a vibrancy out there. There's mm. such um, amount of people that just want to go out and make mm. something happen mm. and that's you know that's why I formed Estless because I think there's an appetite there's a hunger and there's many different ways in which we can reach out to people you know I'm a big supporter of of LinkedIn and the Thank way you. in which you do things <laughs> and um, but equally I think you know marketing comes in more than one layer and this is just another layer of, of what's out there. It's a slice of the pie mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because there's another thing that's a point about World War II, apart from the fact that we both look like Winston Churchill, <laughs> <laughs> um, is this. When, when the UK, you know, Britain as it was then, was facing overwhelming odds, there was a leader who was steadfast in going, we will come back from this, we will mm -hmm. make this happen. And I think that's really important as any business is coming out from this now, is it's not, it's not about being crazy and, and um, you know, reckless, but it is about being steadfast in your determination to make something happen. Because we have felt, you know, if it's just felt like the world's out of control, your control. When mm -hmm. you're a business owner, you feel like you're, to some degree, you're in control. But then when the government says you can't do this and we can't do this, it's like you feel powerless. And, and that's something I'd felt in my old role is, you know, we had staff, and rightly so, dictating the terms in which they wanted to work because they felt comfortable to be at home and we had to accommodate that. And now going into the new business, it is about a language change. It's not, I, I hope this will work, it, it will work. Mm -hmm. There's no, it might work, it will work. And I think you've got to definitely get your mental mindset in a positive way to take on what's probably going to happen you know, the next 12 months. See, as much as we saw the economy plummet, we're going to see the economy grow. And I think you've got to make sure you're ready to take your piece of that. And do you know what's fascinating? I had a big revelation. Then we're going to come to cold calling and mindset in a second. Um, for If you're not Tesco, if you're not Marks and Spencers, if you're not all of these big corporates, there is no shortage of revenue. Mm. If you're a small business, there is no shortage of revenue. I know that sounds um, uh, crazy, but there isn't because you're a micro in a macro, mm -hmm. yeah? You're a little business mm -hmm. in a big economy. And so if you're a smaller business, there's loads of opportunity. You mm -hmm. just have to go seize it. If you're Tesco, you're kind of, you know, you're not gonna double your business. <laughs> if you get five or 6% growth, you're kind of knocking it out the park. 
But I do think the limits that we had on businesses, small businesses, are kind of eased up. But you do have to really work a lot harder and be more determined. <clears throat> it's safe to say that there is no nine to five when you run your own business. You know, you have to be there when the business needs you to be there. And mm -hmm. that's the difference between, you know, having the micro business in a macro environment is that you can go out, you can grab all those opportunities if you're willing to put the time in, but also you've got to develop yourself along the way. And that's one thing that we've talked about already today off camera was how personal development will help um, take a business to new areas, new growth um, and other opportunities. And if you can embrace personal development, go back to the positive mindset, you're on the right track to deliver great business. So, coming to cold calling. <laughs> so, as you know, I'm a wimp with cold calling, <laughs> right? Can't take the rejection, um, all of that stuff. How do you deal with the rejection if you're, you know, it's quite, if you get a lot of no's, mm -hmm. it can be quite soul destroying. Yeah, and, and you've heard the cliche, a no is one step closer to a yes and all of that, but that still doesn't help you. So first thing, you shouldn't get a lot of no's. What should actually happen is if you're conducting yourself in an intelligent way, when you're cold, TM. I am going to keep that. <laughs> um, my new strap line. If you can conduct yourself the right way over the phone, um, if you come across with the right manners, the right pace, the right tone, and have the right information in front of you, um, and you present yourself in a friendly, caring, kind way, obviously it depends on what you're offering, then actually most of the time it's not a no. What it might be is a case of a not now, but it will not be a no. You obviously do get some people though that just decide to scream down the phone at you because they've, you know, something's happened elsewhere and you're just the reason Yeah, but for how it. many of them should you really get? There shouldn't be a lot, but you can never control a human being. You know, the time when you're calling someone, you don't have an appointment time to call them. They're not ready to accept your call. They're not in a place where they go, I'm just going to set these five minutes aside or 10 minutes aside because I think a cold call is going to happen. So you're disrupting their day. So what you've got to basically do is understand that straight away before you make the call is they're not prepped for you. So if you do get somebody who is short tempered, somebody who's not impressed with your style or just not really in the mood for that call um you've got to accept that it's not personal mm -hmm. it's because something's on their agenda something they've got to deal with you don't know what's just hit their email box you don't know what's just come across their desk so it's all about the most polite positive way to finish that call but maybe finish it with an appointment time that's more suitable to call back mm -hmm. and that way then you're on their agenda and then they're ready for your call and all the reasons that they might be a bit brash, rude, should hopefully be taken away. So um, if you are if you are making calls, you know, some people are, that's the route. Mm -hmm. You know, I've spoken to people and they say they'd love to use LinkedIn, but the company says they're not using LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. how, how do you get the customer to give you the time on that call to actually explain what you want to offer? Because, you know, often what they try and do is, is blast you with information. Mm -hmm. How do you get people? Because what you really want is a two-way conversation. Of you, do. you don't really want that kind of blah, 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 blah. No, so when you, this is going back to, if you're using dialers, unfortunately, people are just going to blast you with lots and lots of calls. But the way at Estless we intend to do it, and, and we'll be working through doing it, it's more of a boutique type approach where it'll be more selective. It'll be more about taking the time. You do the research before yeah. you make a call. And then also have a diary open. So if this isn't the right time, the most important outcome of that call is to book a time that is suitable. So then when you go back in, as I said just now, they're prepped and ready for you. We also know that it can take more than one contact now. I think I've seen various different slides from one point of contact to 12 points of contact to somebody buying as part of the buying cycle. So it depends again where they're in that buying cycle and where if somebody before you is offering the same product or service, if they've come in and made a hash of it, then you're not gonna get much luck. But if, you're in, if, if you've got a fair wind and everything's right behind you, you know it's gonna be two or three calls generally before you're going to get that opportunity to ask for the business. And I think you've got to take the pace out of the call and you've got to allow that people are humans and you've got to treat them that way. They're not data. They're not just a number. They're somebody that uh, deserves quality time and you've got to make sure it's the right time for them. And they need to see that it's worth their time as well. Of course. Of course. And again, one of the courses I offer, Simple Steps to Sell, and we talk very 
much about, you know, you have a, a good solid introduction and then you have to seek um, permission to uh, do a good, what I call exploration. So that's when you start with the open questions, start fact finding that client. Mm -hmm. You've got to make sure that as you're entering that call, you're always seeking permission to move to the next stage so that you can then have that two way conversation, extract the relevant information out that's appropriate for the call. So that later on, if you have got the opportunity then to take that call on to a close, um, you have got um, the right product or the right service that matches the client's needs at the time that the client needs them. There's no point, as we've talked about this before, selling ice cream um, in the middle of Christmas or Christmas trees in the middle of summer. You know, there, there's just, you've got to make sure your product, your service is uh, at the same think, time. Do you think where people go wrong with cold calling then? Um, do you think some people just go wrong because they're under pressure to make a sale? A hundred percent. I think great leaders and great managers will give their sales team the trust and responsibility to deliver. With home working, it's really tough because you've got situations where you're trusting somebody not to be sat there watching daytime TV. Netflix. But, well, there is that <laughs> as well, or Star Trek. Um, mm. You can, however, um, when, when we get people back into the office, that the the trust element, which is what a lot of sales managers and leaders fail to have, is trust in their sales team. If you've got the right team and you trust your team, you know they will deliver the results. And results don't grow every month. You don't get month after month, year after year of growth. You're going to have rise and fall. That's the cycle of sales. So as they're rising, you support them for the rise. You keep them motivated. You give them the support, the trust, and, and enough rope for them to go off and make as many sales as possible. When the uh, time and you hit the curve and you're coming back down, it's not about kicking them. It's not about beating them. It's not about saying you haven't done enough calls, you haven't closed enough business. What it's actually about is going, what do you need from me? to help you get back up on that curve again and start growing. So do you think, because I know a lot of businesses put quotas in, mm -hmm. do you think some people end up performing to the quota rather than performing to the result? So a common term is sandbagging in okay. sales. So often what people will do is they'll get to the end of the month and they'll go, well, I've hit my target and I've got five deals here. I'll hold on to that because there's no benefit to me putting that in this month. I'll start next month, so I'll sandbag <laughs> that and then they dump it into next month and hey let's ring the bell or whatever companies do to celebrate success because you know so and so they're, they're trying to knock up they know they've done a decent month so they're trying to knock over the numbers to next month because they're not sure about next month but that impacts the business because if they got those five deals in in the, in the month that they were sold for it would improve the cash flow of the business the client experience would be better because they won't be waiting so actually it's not about what can you do today what can you do this week it's how do we uh, incrementally support and grow the business whilst also looking after our clients mm. and ultimately you've got to look after your staff first but your clients are a close second mm. and without either one of them uh, it becomes a bit of a challenge apparently people are saying you're talking a lot of sense Richard wow. which is good yeah. <laughs> um, so so Richard um, I'm gonna ask you now I've given you a shot on cold calling what do you think of LinkedIn that's not fair. <laughs> I've subscribed to your LinkedIn training. I've, I've had private coaching on LinkedIn and I, I love it. I do. I absolutely love LinkedIn. So it's unfair for you to put me on the spot because I thought you were going to hang me more on cold calling. Um, LinkedIn, there's a place and a massive place for LinkedIn in every business, but it's got to be done right. Um, and the same thing happens on LinkedIn, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to put this to you. Um, how do you think people react when you connect and instantly sold to on LinkedIn? So somebody commented yesterday about this on my one of my posts and said, I think some people appreciate that. And I was like, I'm too polite, but I thought bollocks, but replied nicely. <laughs> is there a beat machine? <laughs> um, I, think, I think it is the equivalence of a, a tar I need to make sales, desperation to make, hit numbers. I go and pitch people. And again, it's an intelligent, you've got to do an intelligent way of communicating with people. So I think, yes, I diss cold calling, but I'm probably not dissing what you're doing. I'm probably dissing what the bad practice, but some of that bad practice is on LinkedIn. But that's no different on LinkedIn to cold calling. Cold calling and cold messaging, that's what yeah. it basically is. So on the cold call, it's, hi, I'm urgently trying to tell you something. Commit today, commit today. Can I, why wouldn't you commit today? I'm not going to let you off the fence. You commit until someone hangs up. And then that's that lead burnt. Yeah. On LinkedIn, it's no different. People hit you up. Hey, I want to expand my network. It looks like we've got common connections. 
Right, OK, well, I'll mm. connect with that. Look at the profile. Do you want to know something funny? I, I was always... just going to say, however, I was going to say, they connect with me if if instantly I get a sales message, they're back out again. No, do you know what I do? Go on. I message them back and say, I think you can improve this. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, I go back to them. And uh, it, it works really well, so I'll, I'll let them in. But what I spot is, obviously, Maverick is a trademarked uh, brand name. So yeah. when they say, oh, I'm really excited about what you're doing with Maverick, I can tell the ones that are just using robots to churn and burn and the Maverick R logo is always after our company name. Mm -hmm. And so I go, right, okay, this is automation. So let's actually go for this. And then I, I reply back. It takes them three hours to reply. And then they go, hi, Dean, blah, 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 blah. And I go, can I, can I just ask you a question about what you've just said? And they go, yes. And then I go, do you think this pitch works? <laughs> <laughs> but that's just my little hobby. But I think you're right. There is a, you know, I'd love it to be, oh, LinkedIn's the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in reality, it's a slice. And you can make a lot of sales with that slice. Mm -hmm. You can make a lot of sales with intelligent cold calling TM. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can make a lot of them, but it is a mix of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, 100%. And, and it's like anything on, on any form of marketing that's out there. You know, you and I have been around the block a few times doing marketing. Um, if you don't get your messaging right, whether that's verbal, written, however you want to produce it, then, you, you know, you are a brand in your own right. So wherever I go, whatever I do, people buying from me, they're not buying from my business because it's me that they're bought You'd into. You'd be surprised how many people say, I, I get what you mean about social selling, mm. but is there any way we can do it from the company page? Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 people buy from people. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't ever expect my company profile page to have as many people following mm. it as my personal page because um, ultimately it's the words i'm using the imagery that i'm using uh, whatever i might put in that's a reflection on me and i think that's important um very often what we're finding in businesses right now as i said people are, are putting out the wrong signals as the air of desperation because we've gone through some terrible times but i think everybody just needs to chill out hit a reset button and go back and look at their business and go, what do I need for my business today? Value proposition. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, no, I just keep saying to people, what they do is they talk about the bells and whistles of yeah. their product or service. Look how good this is. It can, We can do this, we can do that, we've won awards for this. But actually, customers don't care about that. They want to know what your product and service will do for them. Mm -hmm. And what the return will be. Yeah. So value proposition with ROI. I want to go back and trade my intelligent communication, by the way, because I oh, think, okay. or intelligent sales. Okay. I, think that's, I think all of sales comes down to doing a similar thing, which is it's a process. I so often have heard, well, Richard, you're really to go to selling. You can sell yourself, you can sell ice cream to customers, you can sell anything. You must be a born salesperson. And I go, absolutely not. Um, you know, I watched somebody else do it. And that person was my dad at the time. And, you know, he was awesome at get people nodding, getting them buying. And I started to adopt a bit of that. And then over the years, I've had some training and various different levels. Practice, and, though, as well, isn't it? But let's face it, it is not nothing new. I'm mm. not, even on my own courses, you know, I'll say it, there's nothing new that you're going to learn. What you're going to do is go back to what the, all the stuff you've forgotten and all the bad practice that you can take away. Because I always say when in sales as well, people do really well when they join a business, right? Because they're, they're engaging, they're listening to their line manager or leader, boss, whatever. And they're teaching them how to get through the process to sell that product. Then what happens is they go, oh, this is going really well. Actually, I'm really busy now, so I'm gonna cut a few corners. They cut a few corners and then I don't know, three months down the line, they hit the sales wall. It's a bit like writer's block or the running wall. And no matter what they do, they cannot get over that wall. And all I say to people is go back to what made you successful in the beginning. So let's take this right back to basics. What were you doing three months ago that you're not doing now? Mm -hmm. And that is the correct way to try and, and I think that's what we need to take a look at what's so, out there now. And I think I know where you'll sit on this, right? But I'm gonna ask you anyway. So on LinkedIn, there's been a ton of people a ton of people saying um, maybe what we should do is create fake profiles of fake people. And there's tons of them, by the way. One way to spot is check how their heads cropped on their profile pictures. They use AI generated profile pictures mm -hmm. um, and they create these um, fake profiles to like blast people. 
But I've also heard that some telesales people use different names on their calls mm -hmm. because they don't want the flack coming back to them. So um, there was a guy in my old business, you know him, but I won't name him. I had a very distinctive name um, and his name was a name that you don't normally hear. So he did use to change his name every now and then because he might be selling for various products or services where um, there may be a connection somewhere that, you know, in the world where there might be um, competition connections. So he, he always used to change his name. It also helped him understand which campaign he was selling because he would do maybe two or three different ones. I personally don't. I don't think you should be changing your name. I think at the end of the day, if you're out there selling, you're selling yourself again and mm -hmm. the, you want that person to buy back in you. I get the whole thing about having different profiles on social media. And I think there's two reasons why people do it. One is because they obviously want to jeep people. But the second one is they're probably working for an employer. And at that time, they don't want to mix their personal social media page with that of a this said business because once... oh i'm not i'm not talking about i'm talking about completely random fake picture oh, okay works. there's oh. tons of them yeah i've also seen lots of catfish type pictures as well yeah, yeah. where um you know, the, the salesperson they're selling to and i know if somebody's watching this he knows i'm going to be talking about him he's really slim good looking head full of hair smartly dressed but are you when... on about me no but when, but you know, that picture was taken 10 years ago. Um, and if, you know, if, if people would have a shock if they saw my picture, if I put up me with hair on my head and stuff mm. like that, it would be an absolute shock. And you know, and we also know of um, a previous person that was very elaborate on their social media. And I think what you've got to bear in mind, Hype. what you yeah, what you got to bear in mind in sales, in whether that's social, over the phone, face to face is you can only keep that up for so long. Yeah. Um, and actually, if people get to find out the real you, you've just lost all your credibility. I go back to, you are a brand, yeah. and you've got to make sure, first and foremost, you uh, grow your brand and you make sure that it's identifiable, it's recognisable, it's something that people can trust, and then people will then buy from you. Cool. So, maybe I'm not as uh, negative on cold calling as you might think. Um, Intelligent cold call, I think yeah. informed or research, you know, if you're, if you're doing the work, um, then fine. If you're just churning random numbers with no thought process, no nothing, I think that's a bad yeah. bit. But I mean, if you've done some research and go, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you about what we've done. I don't see that as a big deal. No, you've got to make sure your data. So data is the hardest thing to get accurate. And, you know, if you've got great data providers or you're able to create your data and it's really good data, that's half the battle when it comes to cold calling. Because um, a bit like you do on your LinkedIn, you'll research your LinkedIn, you'll find somebody that matches a profile that you're looking for before you connect with them. You wouldn't necessarily just go and go connect, 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 connect. Same on cold calling. Is, You'd be surprised how many people well, do. <laughs> <laughs> something you taught me many years ago not to do. Um, if you can get your data right um, mm -hmm. and your data sets, and you've got to work really hard. You know, there are some good data companies out there. There's some that are selling really bad data. Uh, if you get it wrong, you might as well just burn the next 20 grand in your pocket because it's just not worth the effort. You've got to make sure your data is right. Your data sets are accurate. They're, they're down to the geographical areas, the financials, ins and outs of everything. Mm. And if you can find a good data partner, hold on mm. to them. Because... So we, we were looking at a little project earlier, mm -hmm. and we'll wrap up with this. We were looking at a little combined project that we're going to kind of play with together, whereby um, like a multi-channel strategy, looking at particular areas and businesses in particular areas and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I think there's places where you can merge the two together. So one of the things we've been teaching some of our uh, people, our members and customers, is that it may well be that something starts on LinkedIn and then you, you, know, you get a conversation going, it moves to email, it moves to a video call. They all, you know, something might start on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and go somewhere else. Um, but LinkedIn can be a great prodding mechanism as well. If, if somebody gets busy and they don't reply to your email, you can follow up with them. I would say the great thing about LinkedIn is the cost of LinkedIn is quite low yeah. to start making connections. Do you know how many people still complain? I see it on Facebook in some Facebook groups. Sales Navigator is really expensive. And yeah. I'm like, what? 
Really? Yeah. Access to the biggest B2B database in the world? Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's the thing. But the reason it's expensive is because it's not used properly. Mm. Uh, and I will stress, anybody that hasn't been on a Dean Tedden training course really needs to get on one. I'll just plug it for you. I'll buy you a drink uh, thank when you. the pub's open. <laughs> <laughs> because if you don't master LinkedIn, um, then to get to some, some markets, that's a really yeah. great way. Um, but like you said, marketing is never about one piece of the pie. You've got to combine it. You've got to make sure that the website that you're that you're going to be using or promoting is a good, solid website with great mm. content, regular updated. You've got to make sure your social media is updated. You've got to make sure that your whole branding and your look and your messaging. And I think it's important for businesses to consider every few years refreshing the look and feel of the brand, if still to keep the logo the same, but things like strap lines or variations of how it can look it's important because your website in particular is your shop window um that's where they find out if they're you're credible can you imagine in the high street going up the high street 10 15 years ago and you walk past or say 15 20 years ago you walk past the window and in 12 months time the window hadn't changed mm. You know, you wouldn't think to yourself, that's a shop I want to go in because it's never changed. And your website's got to be the same. You've got to be constantly refreshing, updating. I mean, in my previous role, how many websites have you built for me? Three in four years? Three or four, yeah. In four, in four years, mm. we've had three websites. But they're not, the messaging's still similar, but they're always looking a little bit different mm. so that when people land on it, they go, oh, that's a bit different. So it's very important to keep that, that messaging Good. And just before I go, I have to quickly do a shout out to somebody because Shane Solomon is in awe of the live business shows as he runs one himself. So he said to me to wish you well today. Cool. Um, and uh, he wants to have a cup of coffee with you. Yeah, but Shane, I've not well. seen you in forever. Yeah. Like three years, probably. <laughs> probably at the old place. Oh, yeah. The old place. <laughs> <sighs> I've got I need to take my pills now. Um, cool. So, Richard, thanks for coming. No, thank good to catch you. up. Um, uh, how's the vaccine, by the way? I've not had mine yet, but you've only Yeah, I've had it? my vaccine. It's all good. Did um, you have any of the weird... No, no. I, want, I wanted to pretend to the kids that the arm was going to drop off, but it didn't. No, it was fine. Um, and I think, you know, um, thank God there's a vaccine mm. out there right now. Businesses can open up. Businesses can start trading again. People can start rebuilding the connections. Uh, there's a lot of people at home at the minute that are struggling sort of with mental health. So hopefully, you know, the next six or 12 months, the world's gonna look a lot happier place. Cool, I'm looking forward to that. So on that note, thank you for watching. Thank you, Richard, for coming. And thank you for watching on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere else. Uh, I'm Dean Seddon, thank you for watching.